In the second chapter, we talked about our map of consciousness. And we've come to some pretty interesting conclusions, but most important of them is this one. Your mind is playing tricks on you. It only justifies vibration that you're already in. Or if you really want to be smart about it, you can say, we don't see things as they are. We see things as we are. In a way, reality acts just like a mirror. Whatever events or circumstances you are witnessing, they will be picked up by your senses and filtered through your mind. And your mind will create thoughts and emotions and perceptions that are 100% consistent with vibratory state that you are already in. And then the real magic happens. Your mind will fool you into believing that whatever you are thinking or feeling about that particular situation is 100% right, quote unquote. Or it is objectively right. It is the only possible way to perceive that particular situation. And actually, it isn't. It is just function of the vibratory state that you are already in at that particular moment. So let's say we have two persons standing next to each other, and one of them is currently somewhere at the lower part of our consciousness map, let's say he or she is angry, and the other one is on the higher part of our consciousness map, let's say he or she is on the level of acceptance. So they are witnessing the same thing, they are watching something. And they both have uh, perceptions and emotions and thoughts that are 100% consistent with their vibratory state. But since it is not the same vibratory state, their thoughts and emotions and perceptions are going to differ, well, considerably. But they will both be 100% certain that they are objectively right. And please remember that whenever you have some kind of discussion about what is, going, what is really going on in the world. So, you picked up some newspaper article and you have some thoughts or emotions about that, and the other person has something completely different. It is all about the vibratory state that you are already in at that particular moment you are not objectively right. Of course, the other person too, <laughs> but <laughs> you just take care of yourself and you're, you're fine. So, we know that our mind is playing tricks on us and we know what our aim is. And our aim is to get as high as possible on this consciousness map as we possibly can. And now the question remains. How? <laughs> How am I going to raise my level of consciousness? Is there some secret, some technique, <laughs> something that will help me do that? And actually there is, and it isn't secret at all, because <laughs> that recipe for raising your own level of consciousness is 2700 years old, believe it or not. And it was given to us by an Indian guy that was born under the name of Gautama Siddhartha, but he is much widely, much better known as the Buddha. And uh, on the internet you can find a lot of interesting stories about Buddha's life and so on. We are not going too much into details because it's not too relevant for our story today. What is relevant is that Buddha was well, nothing special. He wasn't son of God. He wasn't Messiah. He wasn't some great prophet. He was just an ordinary guy, just like you and me, who stumbled to a solution to age-old problem, how to raise your own level of consciousness. And he was kind enough to tell us that secret. <laughs> so we are going to share it with you today. But the fact that he was not anything special is really encouraging. 
Because what he did, what he found out, uh, the recipe that he followed and successfully followed to raise his own level of consciousness, and by all accounts, he reached enlightenment. So <laughs> he is a good source <laughs> to find out about how to lift our level of consciousness. You can do this too. Because there's nothing special about it. There's nothing that needs some special abilities. You don't need to be a superhero to do that. You just need to follow the recipe and understand what he was talking about. And he wasn't exactly a man of many words. You know, he didn't write a 2000 page book, four volumes of it. <laughs> All you need to know is uh, actually core teaching of the Buddhism today, and that is four noble truths. And you don't need to believe in anything. I know when I say Buddhism, then a lot of people have assumptions that because it is a religion, now I need to believe in something, in some special form of higher power or whatever. Actually, no. What is required what is needed here is not willingness to believe, it is willingness to find out, and that's the exact opposite. Please don't believe it. You try it for yourself and find out for yourself if the recipe is working for you. Okay? So you are encouraged not to believe in anything. Actually, Buddha himself told us, believe nothing, no matter where you read it or who said it, no matter if I have said it, unless it agrees with your own reason and your own common sense. So these four noble truths that we are going to talk about, these are not, you know, commandments, orders from some higher power that will punish you if you don't believe. <laughs> no, no, no. These are mere, well, suggestions. Buddha stumbled onto a solution. He found a way how to raise his own level of consciousness. And he gave us the recipe. And you can use it or not. It's up to you. And it is quite simple. Only four things well to understand. I mean, why four? Well, there is actually a very good reason for it. You know, when you go to doctor, for example, you have a sore throat. And you go to doctor and doctor says, ah, okay, yeah, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then doctor will give you four things. Okay. First, he will give you a diagnosis. So what is actually going on with you? And maybe doctor will say, okay, yeah, you have laryngitis. You have sore throat because you have laryngitis. Secondly, what doctor will tell you is cause. What caused your laryngitis? And maybe he will say, oh, you know, there's some bacteria that you picked up or maybe you shouldn't drink too much cold drinks <laughs> as you do or something like that. So, what caused your condition? Third, he will give you a prognosis. So, maybe he will say, oh, don't worry, you know, I will give you a cure and it will take maybe about a week or something like that for you to get better. And then, of course, your doctor will give you the cure. And he will say, okay, take this antibiotic and drink a lot of warm tea and uh, stay at home and so on and so on. And that's exactly what Buddha did. He positioned himself as a doctor, not as a, a great spiritual teacher that's bringing higher wisdom from the clouds. He positioned himself as a doctor and he said, okay, we have something that we, called, that we are calling suffering. We, in our lives, suffer. We are not happy with how things are. And the Buddha was interested in two things and two things only, by his own admission. 
what is the cause of our suffering and how to remove it. <laughs> it would be <laughs> quite depressing <laughs> if, he was, if he didn't give us the cure, the solution for that. So, four noble truths. Diagnosis, cause, prognosis and cure. Okay, let's start from number one. Noble truth number one. Diagnosis. Everybody suffers. <laughs> All life is suffering, misery and emotional pain. And that really sounds depressing, but actually it's not. It's very good news. Because if you have suffering in your life, if you suffer, if you have some misery, if you are unhappy, it's quite all right. Because everyone has that condition, you are nothing special. And just wait for it, because there is Noble 2, 2, 3 and 4 that will give you a recipe how to get rid of it. But don't fall into despair and apathy or guilt, because something is wrong with me. I'm the only one who suffers. No, you are not. Everyone suffers. And that's quite all right. Now, I noticed that in these days we are so used to suffering that when, I, when someone says, are you suffering or is there a cure to suffering or something like that, your mind immediately jumps to the most extreme ways of suffering that you can possibly conjure. And maybe you are visualizing or picturing yourself in some torture chamber, being waterboarded in some basement, <laughs> or having some terrible illness and terrible pain. Well, you know, sure, that is suffering, but it is actually much more than that. And this is exactly how Buddha defined it. So, birth is suffering, aging is suffering, illness is suffering, death is suffering, but also union with what is displeasing, separation from what is pleasing, and not to get what one wants. So, as you can see from these Buddha's bullet points, <laughs> power points, <laughs> you know, suffering is much, much more everyday thing than just, you know, being in some extreme pain or being tortured, <laughs> something like that. Because, you know, even when life is going well and things are good, there is always some, like an undercurrent of anxiety, and uh, uncertainty, and there's always some itching in the pit of your stomach. Uh, something isn't right. That's suffering too. But we are so used to it that we don't even notice it anymore. Okay, so suffering is normal in a way that everyone has it. But it is curable. And we are just coming to that. Noble truth number two. Cause. Cause of our suffering is desire and ignorance. And this is actually the most important noble truth, because once you understand what causes your suffering, you are in much, much, much better position to, well, remove it from your life. So, we'll get back to that. And right now we are going to noble truth number three. Prognosis. And the prognosis is, there is a cure. Solution is always available to us. And this is also a very encouraging thought. Because, first of all, there is a solution. <laughs> That's encouraging. But also, solution is always available to us. It was available to us yesterday. It is available to us right now. And it will be available to us tomorrow, or in a two years, or in a ten years whenever you are ready. There is no need to rush things. It's quite all right. And then we are coming to noble truth number four, the cure. And the cure is Eightfold Path, Buddha's Eightfold Path, that is having right view, right resolve, right speech, right conduct, right livelihood, right effort, 
right concentration and right meditation. Now, this is a bit surprising. You know, when we talked about the causes of our suffering, we said that the cause of our suffering are desire and ignorance. So, why not just, you know, remove your desire and learn something that you will maybe remove your ignorance, right? Well, actually, that doesn't work. <laughs> and you'll see in a minute why. And the cure is, well, right view, right resolve, right speech, and so on and so on. And you don't need to remember this because we are just going to substitute this for a much simpler version. And that is meditation and a way of life that is consistent with it, that doesn't create unnecessary suffering to yourself or others. Now, this is also maybe a little bit confusing. Why would I create unnecessary suffering to myself? Well, <laughs> that's exactly what you are doing. And that is really critical issue that we are going to discuss now in much more details. So, let's go back, as we promised, to noble truth number two. And noble truth number two says that causes of our suffering or cause of our suffering is desire and ignorance. Let's take it one by one. First, desire. Desire comes in two forms. Actually, it's one thing, it's the same thing, but it's just like, a, you know, two sides of the same coin. And these are attachment and aversion. So, by attachment, you can also say craving or clinging or grasping. And actually, this category deals with things that you want. And suffering is coming from either losing what you like or not getting what you like, not getting it at all. Other category, aversion, you can call it resistance or rejection or denial, and it deals with things you don't like. And suffering comes from, well, getting them nevertheless. <laughs> but it's all about you. It's about your own attachments and your own resistances. And I don't blame you if you're still not 100% convinced. I mean, it is a little bit difficult to believe that we are creating our own suffering, right? I mean, why should we? We want to be happy, right? Of course, it's not on conscious level. We are suffering because of our own inability to control our desires. And these desires, these attachments and resistances come in many forms. Some of them are obvious, some of them are more subtle. But let's start with a few obvious ones, just to get us going and we'll see where they will lead us. So, what are we attached to? Well, we are attached to people. That's quite obvious. There are people that we really like and there are people that we really don't like. So, there are people that we are attached to and we, there are people that we have, well, some kind of resistance to. But let's start with this. So, if you are still struggling to understand what attachment is and you have a kid at home, there you go. You are 100% guaranteed attached to your kids. And let's say that your son is about uh, first, second grader, so maybe six, seven years going to school. How do you feel when your son is at school? It doesn't matter what you are doing or where you are. Maybe you are at home, maybe you are at your office, maybe you are in a park. But when you are separated from your kid, because he is in school, that's a very good reason to be separated from him, how do you feel? You worry, right? You worry. You know on a conscious level that your worrying won't help anyone. It won't change a thing. The only thing that you are doing with your worrying is infusing yourself with the vibration of anxiety and fear. All right? Because who knows what might happen? Is he happy at school? What if something happened? I mean, look, if something happens, you will be notified. School will probably call you and then you will deal with that situation. But right now, 
you don't know what's going on and it's probably 99.999% everything is fine. So your worrying is actually doing nothing but lowering your vibration. And you are unhappy, you are anxious, you have that undercurrent of uncertainty and, you know, in the pit of your stomach, you are doing it yourself. There is no reason for that right now, because probably, most probably, everything is fine. But your worrying creates very bad, very low vibration of fear, completely unnecessary. Why? Because you're attached to your kid. I mean, at that school there are probably hundreds of kids, hundreds of kids. But you are not worried about any of them. You are only worried about your own kid because you are not that attached to the other kids. And of course, if any other kid needs help, you will help him or her, of course. But you are not going to spend time worrying about is everything fine with your neighbor's kid. You are only worried about your own kid because you have strong attachment to him. And once you recognize that, once you recognize that you are worrying completely unnecessary and that's not helping anyone, it only makes you feel, well, anxious and afraid, it's lowering your vibration, it's actually cutting you from the higher vibrations, from the inspiration that you might need if something ever happens. But right now, everything is fine. And probably everything will be fine tomorrow and the day after tomorrow. Are you really going to spend that time worrying? <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't suggest. <laughs> okay, Because you are not doing anyone a service. Actually, you're doing quite the opposite. You're doing quite the opposite because you are now vibrating at the lower frequency and that vibration propagates into the collective and you are cutting yourself off the higher vibrations and when you are finally reunited with your kid in a maybe two or three hours when he gets back from school, you are not going to be in that loving mood because you spent all your day worrying. You will still have a residue of that vibration of fear and worry and anxiety. And you are doing it yourself. Because you cannot control your attachment, in this case, to your kid. The same goes for jealousy. I mean, jealousy is, you know, terrible emotion. I hope you agree. That's kind of suffering, form of suffering. You are jealous because you are attached to your partner. And you resist idea that one day you are going to be separated, that he's going to leave you or her is going to leave you. And right now, everything is fine. But the idea what might happen in the future is, well, not only helping, but it's actually destroying your happiness in this very moment. And in that way, not only it doesn't help to, for you to uh, uh, somehow strong, make your relationship with your partner stronger, it's actually destroying it. Because if you are interrogating your partner, aha, uh -huh, you are 15 minutes late, where have you been? Mm, I, I suspect something. Then one day he'll say, you know what, <laughs> this is hell. <laughs> I mean, come on. What, what, what have I done to make you feel that way? Probably nothing. Probably nothing. And right now everything is fine. You are at home, you are watching a movie maybe, everything is great. But your mental complaining, your worrying, your judgment, what's good, what's not, what might happen, what not, that comes from your attachment to your partner and from your resistance to the idea you don't want to be separated from him. You want him to be 
here with you forever, is creating a help for you. Yeah. You don't just don't do it. Just recognize that this moment is perfect. You're at home, everything is fine, and you're enjoying your time together. And just release that tension. You don't need it. Actually, it's doing the opposite of what you are saying that you want. You want your partner to be happy with you for the rest of your life, and you are not helping that wish with being, well, bitch. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that, that's how, the, how things usually go. But of course, there are people that we have resistance towards. Not, not everyone you like. Because, for example, you don't like maybe your boss or your colleagues. Let's say that you don't like your colleagues. Does that, how does that influence your thoughts about going to work? Terrible, right? Because in a Sunday morning, you will think, oh, tomorrow is Monday and I need to go back to work with all those, you know, idiots and oh, I, don't, I need a better job, I need <laughs> better colleagues, I need... I want better job and better colleagues. I don't want to see these guys <laughs> that I really don't like. And right now, it's Sunday morning, it's a beautiful day. You are at home with your family, with your kids, with your husband, partner. Everything is great. Everything is fantastic. But how do you feel? And what are you thinking about? And what is your perception of reality in that moment? It is all 100% consistent with vibratory state that you're already in. So you're thinking about how you don't want to go to work. And that's probably some kind of desire or even anger because you have unfulfilled desire not to see these idiots tomorrow. And you will have angry thoughts and you will have angry memories, because suddenly you will remember how that colleague of yours made you angry last week and the other one made you angry six months ago, blah, blah, blah. And then your kid is going to ask you, Mom, how about going to park? And you say, I don't have time for that, because you are reacting from the level of anger. Instead, just let it go. Let it go. Just Clear your... That doesn't mean that you, tomorrow you are not going to go to work. That doesn't mean that tomorrow, when you come to your office, everything will be great and you will suddenly love those people. No! It's just recognizing that in this moment, that has nothing to do with you. And you deal with that tomorrow. Right now, what you should do is enjoy time with your family. Or <laughs> spend time worrying about how you should or shouldn't go to this or that job and what your colleagues should or shouldn't be and so on and so on. And you are creating your own misery in this particular Sunday morning situation that is actually in by itself great. So we are attached to, our, to people. We have resistance to some people, and so on and so on. Also, we are attached to material things. Let's say, for example, that one week ago, I bought a car of my dreams. From my early childhood, all I wanted is to have that particular sport car. And then I worked hard and uh, sacrificed a lot of things in my life and now I finally bought it and there it is on the parking lot right now. Now, let's say that I hear from the parking lot someone, you know, maybe talking, maybe arguing or maybe two cats fighting. I will immediately jump to the window to see what's going on. Are these cats scratching my 
fresh, beautiful coat, <laughs> coating or paint or my car. You know, what's going on with my car? Is everything fine? Or if I see people moving, maybe I'll just see, well, maybe someone is going to try to steal it from me and I worry right now because I'm attached to that car. It doesn't have anything to do with circumstances. Nothing is going on. Yeah, two cats are fighting. Big deal. <laughs> but I worry, if I worry, that that cat is going to ruin uh, beautiful polish and coating on my car, I will be anxious. I will have certain anxiety, uncertainty. What if this happened? What if that happened? And so what? So may maybe that cat will scratch my car a little bit. Is that really worth the tension that I'm feeling right now? Let's say instead of that, that I have 10 years old economy car, smaller, <laughs> and I'm not attached to that car at all. I mean, it's just a useful device that goes from point A to point B, and that's pretty much about it. That doesn't mean I don't want that car to be in a good condition. Of course I do. I want to be able to move from point A to point B safely. So I want that car to work properly. But you know what? Two cats are fighting on the parking lot. Yeah, let them fight. Because I'm not attached to that car. Also, we are attached to our jewelry, especially if the jewelry has emotional value for us. And then you have maybe a wedding ring and you are terrified that you might lose it. <laughs> but if you have some kind of jewelry that you are not that attached to, you don't care. And if you are terrified that you are going to lose that ring of great emotional value, you will suffer. I mean, you do understand, you feel that, right? Okay. So, also, we are attached to the idea of money. You know, if you don't have enough money, so you can say, I want money, I'm attached to the idea of having money, or you can say, I don't want to be poor. It's just a matter of phrasing. And that idea puts you again in desire and anger and so on. And you will be envious of people who are having money. And that's also kind of a suffering. Because my life will be much better when I have money. Okay, maybe it will. But right now, you don't have as much money as you wish. And you don't know that's going to be enough once you get to that marker, but never mind. You are suffering right now. You're spoiling the right now. The, this moment, you're spoiling this moment. Now, that's important. Because maybe you didn't notice, but it's always now. It's never tomorrow. <laughs> tomorrow is an interesting concept because it allows us to plan and make decisions and so on, and that's great. But we can talk right now about tomorrow. But when that tomorrow comes, it will be right now. It is always now. The only important thing is how are you feeling, meaning in what vibratory state you are right now. Because your thoughts, your emotions, your perceptions, your memories depend or are dependent on the vibratory state that you are in right now. And it is always now. Don't spoil now for something that you want or for something that you don't want. Something that you are attached to, that you are clinging to, grasping to, or something that you have aversion or resistance or denial, something that you don't want. When you are jealous because what might happen with your relationship, you are suffering right now. When you are attached to your car or attached to your house and you're really worried that someone is going to scratch your car, you are 
We're destroying this moment. You're lowering your vibration in the now. And that is only what matters. When you are attached to your kid and you are worrying what's going on with him in school, you are destroying the moment right now. That's all you need to worry about is the moment right now. The power for creating a better future is contained in the present moment. You create a good future by creating a good present. We are also attached to emotions. Now, this is really interesting concept. We are attached to the idea of being happy and we have resistance or aversion to being in anger or fear or grief or whatever. So, you are going to avoid all situations that you think is going to make you angry. And if that's not possible, you are going to suffer in advance. So, you know, for example, that seven days from now, you are going to be in a situation that you cannot avoid that will make you angry. That can be family dinner, that can be meeting with someone that you really don't like, <laughs> whatever. You are resisting that situation. And although it's going to happen a week from now, you suffer now. Why do I need to go to that stupid meeting? Why do I need to be in that situation? I don't want to be. I don't want to be in that situation. I am attached to the idea of not being, well, let's say, angry. Or I, am, I resist the idea of being angry. That's, that's completely the same thing. You shouldn't even be attached to happiness. Now, this is a really weird idea. We want to be happy. I mean, this course, it's all about being happy and successful. And great, you be happy and you be successful, but don't get attached to it. And this is what it means. So, let's say, for example, that you are in some kind of party and it's excellent and it's beautiful and people are singing and dancing and everything is great, there's food and drinks and it's perfect. And let's say that party is going to last until midnight and now it's 10 o'clock, so two more hours. If you get attached to the idea that this party should go on forever, you are going to suffer although you are in a perfect setting. So, you are sitting in the middle of a party that's brilliant and you are angry because you want this party to go on forever or you want this par party like this every Saturday or whatever. You are going to be unhappy in the middle of beautiful situation, because you are angry, because your desire that these parties should last longer or whatever is um, <laughs> going to haunt you. In the same way, you can have resistance that the party is about to be over. So, let's say around midnight, people are starting to say goodbyes and what you shouldn't do is, no, please stay, stay just for 15 minutes. That's kind of resistance to the idea that the party is well finished. So, you can be in the most beautiful setting and still angry because that should happen more often or I, I want it to last longer or I don't want I, I don't want that to end, I want that to go further. You shouldn't be attached to happiness. Because let's say let's say today you are you're really happy and everything is perfect. The fastest way to destroy that happiness in this particular moment is to think about how this happiness won't last. And you know what? It won't. <laughs> I mean, sooner or later, something will happen that is not going to be consistent with the environment that is creating you happy. Because you can't control 
external circumstances. They are going to change. If they are perfect now, that means that the only way is down. And sooner or later, it will. if you get attached to happiness, then you are in real trouble. Or if you resist the idea that that happiness is going to end because you know that it will. Don't do it. Just enjoy the moment as fully as you can. And in that way, you are actually creating more, uh, well, let's say, probability that that form of happiness will be longer and more often and so on and so on. Don't destroy your happiness by being attached to happiness or being in resistance of unhappiness. <laughs> that will come. Also, now we are starting a little bit on those subtle categories, not so obvious. We get attached to our fantasies. We are thinking about things and we are, by imagining it, we are kind of making them real and then we are angry. So, let's take a previous example. If you think about your partner cheating you, your mind makes it real and it will put you in vibration as that is actually going on. And it isn't. You can also imagine situation in the future and, you know, one day I will live on tropical island and I will drink cocktails all day long and some beautiful girl or guy is going to massage. Oh, that's what I need. Yeah, that's what I need. And you actually suffer <laughs> because you are attached to that idea. And of course, you know that that's not this side, this moment. That will come maybe in the future, but actually you're not sure. And there is a certain uncertainty about that situation and you really want that situation and that's going to put you on the level of, let's say, desire. And you are going to suffer because why don't I have that? I need that. I should have born, been born rich. I want to be rich and why my mother <laughs> wasn't born rich so that I can whatever, get that money and blah, 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 blah. And you suffer because you are visualizing, you're creating scenario that just isn't true. It's so, and it's okay unless you're attached to it. So you can daydream, of course. You can have fantasies, that's great. But if you get attached to it, that's what I need, that's what I want, and I don't want it any other way, you are going to suffer because it's not right now. You are spoiling the right now moment. You could be happy right now. Just by releasing the idea that you will be happy in the future once certain circumstances are met and you don't know if these circumstances are going to be met. So you are suffering right now. That's a really terrible thing to do. We, you can also suffer from your memories. You know, 15 years ago, my life was beautiful, I was happy, I was free. But then this happened and that happened and I needed to get a job and my husband left me and so blah, 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 blah. That was 15 years ago. That's not right now. but. If you are thinking about that in this moment, you are spoiling this moment, you are recreating some scenario from past, either pleasant or unpleasant. If it's pleasant, then you are going to be, there's going to be certain resistance because I don't, I never wanted that to end. Or you get attached to that scenario, you want that to happen again. You're spoiling this moment, this moment you're spoiling because you're believing your fantasies. And you know what, well, fantasies are fine if you don't get attached or if you don't create resistance to them. Because if you are not really careful, 
your mind will make it real. It will put you into vibration of that situation. And now this is really interesting. If you are remembering something that was really pleasant from the past, we already said that all your thoughts and perceptions and emotions and memories are consistent with vibratory state that you're already in. So, if you are able to remember time when you were really, really happy, that means that you are already in a vibration of happiness. You don't have access to memories that are stored on different vibratory levels. So, by remembering things you actually recreate vibration that goes with that memory. Or, to be more precise, you wouldn't be able to remember it at all if you are not in the vibratory state that they, uh, well, carry with themselves. So, you can remember happy things, that's great, because that proves, that, that puts you in vibration. The, idea that the fact that you are able to remember then means that you're already in that state. But if you then get attached to it, let's say, I, I really want this to happen. Why can't I have that situation that I had 15 years ago? Now it's a different vibratory state. Now it's a vibratory state of desire. I want that to happen. Or anger because it that is unfulfilled desire. So you can get in a level of desire, and that is completely different level. When you start thinking about how you want that to happen again, immediately you will get some memories and thoughts and perceptions of all the other things that you didn't get. <laughs> so, Visualizing and fantasizing is fine unless you get attached to it or you have resistance that that is not going to happen if it's pleasant and if it's unpleasant then you have attachment that's not going to happen and the resistance that's going to happen it's all the same. So we get attached to our own fantasies and that's really weird <laughs> because it is a reaction to something that never ever happened. In Taken from the perspective of this moment, your memory of certain event is being recreated in this moment. And just don't get attached to it. Okay? Of course, we are also attached to circumstances, because I want tomorrow to be a sunny day. And I don't want it to rain. <laughs> or maybe you're invited to a party that you don't feel like going. Maybe it's a wedding party and you were invited to that wedding party a month ago. At that, at that moment, that seemed perfect. That seemed like a great idea. But you know what? It's going on this evening and you are really, really tired. And you just, or you just don't feel like going for whatever reason. And then you are sitting in your couch, in your, at home, in your sofa, melting <laughs> and thinking, oh my God, now I need to go there. I don't want to go there. You don't, I mean, why not? You know, it is suffering doesn't come from that particular situation because that situation has not yet well, come to pass. You are not at that party right now. But when you are resisting the idea that you should go and you're attached to the idea that maybe you will just stay at home, you are suffering in that particular moment. And now you can imagine that you're, you're some kind in, you have a camera in your home. And in your mind, there is, I don't want, I want, I, I would rather not go, and my partner, and my kids, and in the past, and in the future, and I want this, and I don't want that. And that camera is recording what's going on. And for someone who is watching the recording or live feed, it's just you sitting in a sofa, 
changing your face. <laughs> Actually, it's nothing going on. Nothing is going on. In your mind, terrible things. <laughs> terrible things. And, you know, that's exactly what Mark Twain said, uh, meant when he said, I've lived through some terrible things in my life, some of which actually happened. That's exactly right. You know, a lot of things are going on in your mind. Terrible things are going on in your mind. Or, as he said, in my life. Yeah, because your life consists of this moment, and then next, this moment, and next, and next, and next. It's all about how you feel right now. Everything else, past and future, it's all just mental construct. Maybe that will be like that, maybe it won't be like that. But, you know, who knows? Maybe. <laughs> you can live through terrible things and they won't even happen. So we get attached to circumstances and to fantasies and to emotions and to concepts and to people and to things and so on and so on. Even we get attached to authorities, you know, because the law says this and because the law says this, that's the right thing to do. You know what? Law is just an opinion with a gun. <laughs> it's just a perspective. It's just a point of view. But how many times have you heard that that can be done? Because it, the law doesn't uh, allow that opportunity. Okay, maybe we should rethink that law. Maybe that law is fine, okay? I'm not attached to the idea that that law should be changed, and I don't have any resistance to the idea that that law should be changed or stay as it is, however you wish to phrase it. But just because the law says, just because some holy scripture says, just because uh, you know, someone you believe and you respect told you something that doesn't necessarily mean that it is going to work for you. That's why Buddha said, believe nothing, no matter where you read it or who said it, no matter if I have said it, unless it agrees with your own reason and your own common sense. Don't take anything for granted. Don't take it, you know, just try it. That's because you actually, when you get attached to whatever concept, so it can be, you know, pro-choice or pro-life. And some people are vegetarians and some people are eating meat. And uh, some people, you know, are uh, for gun control and some people are for that everyone has right to own a gun in his home and so on. And there are all different concepts and I am Democrat and you are Republic and I am employed in public sector and you are employed in private sector and these are all just concepts and there are all authorities and laws and books and scriptures and that's fine if you agree with them. That's perfect, if that resonates with you, but if it doesn't resonate with you, well, just drop it. I mean, if you can, sometimes you can't, you know, sometimes the law of says something that you don't agree with, and you, if you feel so inclined, should do everything that you can to change that law, but don't break it because it will, go, it will make you feel unsafe. You know, by breaking the law, you will start to worry. <laughs> you will start to worry what's going to happen if someone is going to uh, find you, if they are going to lock you, if they are going to put you in jail. And that puts you in a vibration of fear. Don't do that. Okay? Because it's all about perspective. All those teachings, all those ideas, all those authorities, they are acting out of their perspective, their point of view. And somehow, when you attach to that, you feel the need to be right. 
And as we already discussed in the beginning of this particular video, whatever your vibratory state is, you will have thoughts and emotions and perceptions and memories that are consistent with it and your mind will make it right. So, you know, being everyone is right, but from their own perspective, from their own point of view. So, all talks about politics and religion and laws and concepts like equality and democracy and free market and globalization, is it good or is it bad? It's all just point of view. And it's okay if you have your own point of view, of course, but don't get attached to it. Because, first, that leads to suffering. Because you will feel the need to defend your own point of view. Okay? And then, while defending your point of view, you have, of course, resistance to any other point of view. And that will just get you in trouble. And actually, you don't know. This is the beginning of real wisdom. Understanding and knowing that actually you don't know. You have perspective, you have point of view, you have opinion and that's great, but you need to leave at least a possibility that other points of view are equally possible. Sometimes you are not going to agree with other people's point of view. So, they have political opinion that's completely opposite of your own political opinion. Okay, if you are attached to the idea that your political opinion is the only one, or religious, or about law, or about whatever, you will feel the need to defend it. And that will get you into suffering and you won't be able to recognize other people's point of view. Maybe they are right. Or maybe in their idea that is completely unacceptable is 5% brilliant genius. Maybe you can take that 5% and incorporate it into your concept, make it even better. But even then, don't get attached to it. Because you're closing the doors to all the other uh, ideas that you could possibly do. Even when you are absolutely, 100% objectively sure that you are right. So, for example, 